here are in their final year of school this year? Anybody? Okay. How many people have jobs? <laughs> How many people brought their resumes? Okay. How many people wish they listened to their mother and going to medical school? Anybody? <laughs> Anybody? Okay. okay. Um, the reason I was invited to speak today is two reasons. One, to show you that there are business people in Washington, D.C. I think I'm the only <laughs> business person here. Everybody else is running the country or helping to make the world a better place. I'd like to think business people do that to some extent, but there aren't as many business people here as the people you're going to see. And secondly, I am the least prominent person you're going to see in this program. <laughs> Everybody else here has done things much more than I have. And um, the reason I uh, think they asked me to speak is because my record of getting to where I am is a lesson in persistence a bit. And, and it shows you that no matter what you do in life, you're probably going to have some failures, and so don't give up. And let me explain what I mean. I was interested not in being a business person. Uh, my goal in life was to uh, really work at the White House, be a policy advisor, work in politics, and practice law. And I tried all those three things, and let me describe what happened. When I, <laughs> when I, when I started practicing law, after a few years in New York, the, um, I went to my, my partners that I was practicing with. I was a young associate. I went to the partners and said, you know, I'm thinking of doing something else. Uh, do you have any ideas? And they said, well, just let us know when you're going to leave. Uh, nobody seemed to care that I was thinking of leaving. Uh, when I told all my clients I was thinking of leaving, none of them seemed to care. So I got the sense that maybe I wasn't a great lawyer. And in truth, uh, you know, nobody cared. When I left the firm, nobody really mattered. Nobody cared. So I got the sense that maybe my ambition to be a great lawyer wasn't, wasn't really there and, and, and didn't deserve to be there. And then I decided I'd get into politics. So I joined a campaign of a man running for President of the United States in 1976. His name was Birch Bayh. And I was convinced he'd be President of the United States. Um, he dropped out after about a month after I joined the campaign. So I, I realized that maybe my skill set wasn't so wonderful. So then I said, I'll try this one more time. I got a call, and you'll get these calls yourself uh, out of the blue sometimes. Serendipity is a big factor in life. A call from somebody I never knew who said he'd heard about me, and would I go, want to go work for another presidential campaign? I rolled my eyes and said, well, the first one that only lasted a month after I was in it, I'll try. And this person was Jimmy Carter. And so I went to work down in Atlanta for Jimmy Carter, and uh, he did win, as you all know. Um, but when I joined, he was 33 points ahead of Gerald Ford. When the campaign was over, after my work, he only won by one point. Uh, so Carter always wondered, what was it that I did that deserved uh, um, a job in the government? And I wasn't sure. I, I realized that in politics, probably I wasn't very good. I, I, I hurt two campaigns. But if you want to get a job in the White House, and many of you, if you have a chance to do so, should do so, it's, it's very intoxicating. Uh, if you're a young person, I was three years out of law school. I got a job because I worked in the campaign. White House staffs are not often filled on merit. Uh, many other things in our country are filled on merit. White House staffs may not be completely. Uh, working the campaign helps. And so if you hang around long enough, you might get a job in a White House staff if you work in a campaign. So I got a job as the Deputy Domestic Policy Advisor to the President of the United States three years out of law school, a job I wasn't qualified for, clearly. Uh, he wasn't qualified, President Carter, for his job either, so I didn't feel <laughs> out of place. In fact, nobody was qualified in that White House staff. Um, <laughs> My job was to fight inflation, and you were too young to remember this, but I got it to 19%. Very difficult to get inflation at 19%. Um, there was a rumor, though, that I was going to be appointed the senior domestic policy advisor if Carter was reelected, and Carter's view is that he lost his election based on that rumor. I don't know if that's true, but I did find that what Harry Truman once said is true. If you want a friend in Washington, buy a dog. Because all the people came to tell me how great I was when I was in the White House in the West Wing. I'm running around telling the president what to do. He's asking me his, uh, my views. Not one person called me back after I called them the day after we lost the election. After the, the, we lost the election, I called them in looking for a job, and none of these people told me how great I was. All of a sudden, wanted to call me back. So remember, in Washington, it can be very cruel. So I went out and, and practiced law again. And once again, after a couple of years, I went to my partners and said, um, I'm thinking of leaving. What do you think? And they said, please don't worry about leaving. Anytime you want to leave, it's fine. Uh, the same was true of my clients. So with not knowing what I, how complicated it would be, I set up a firm in Washington called Carlisle. Some of you may have heard of it now. And it's a large private equity firm. And it, and it took off because I didn't follow conventional wisdom. When you follow conventional wisdom, you almost certainly won't, won't succeed. In Washington, it is often said that the conventional wisdom in Washington is almost always wrong, and it almost always is. Remember, people said the health care bill was dead. Well, now the health care bill, more or less, is going to be law. Uh, in Washington, it was said you can't build a private equity firm. You have to be in New York. 
But my theory was that if you take advantage of the situations you find yourself in, you can, you can do almost anything you want. Uh, there was a famous minority leader of the Senate named Edward Dirksen, who was involved in, when the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed. And he famously said that if you're getting kicked out of town, get out in front and pretend you're leading a parade. Now, what did he mean? He meant take advantage of the situations you find yourself in. So in Washington, D.C., when I wanted to set up a private equity firm, people in New York would laugh because they say, how can you do this in Washington? I said, well, we understand companies that um, are, are affected by the U.S. government better than anybody else. Aerospace defense companies, telecommunications companies, other companies that are heavily affected by government, we understand them better than people in New York. And our investors more or less believe that in the end. And in the end, it turned out to be true because actually we did spend more time knowing, knowing these companies. So I took advantage of the situation I found myself in. Uh, the things I wanted to just say to you briefly in the, in the minutes that I have are a couple points. One, all of you um, should take a little bit of a lesson from my situation, and it is don't think that you're going to know what you're going to do uh, with your life at the age you are now or really before you're 30 or 35. You should do as many different things as you can because you aren't going to know exactly what's going to work. In my case, I failed at practicing law. I wasn't good at it. I was terrible at politics, and I wasn't very good in government, as you can see. And then in the end, my career took off because in private equity it worked out. And that was really the fourth of my careers. So my first three careers didn't really work out. So all of you should not think if I don't, if you don't have a job right now or you don't know what you're going to do, don't worry about it. The only people really concerned about are your parents probably. They're, they're worried that you're not going to succeed. But that doesn't make a difference. What you do before the age of 30, in my view, doesn't really make that much difference because what you should do is try many different things. What you should do is what you want to do. Uh, my mother had wanted, was determined that I'd be a dentist. Her view was that was the greatest thing that life's calling. It didn't have uh, you know, no emergency hours and nice income and so forth. And you can call yourself a doctor. Um, um, <laughs> I didn't want to be a dentist. I, I said, suppose I get arthritis in my fingers, what's going to happen? My career could fall apart. So I just didn't want that. And so do what you want to do and not what your parents want you to do. Um, so you really, and, and, and you succeed at anything in life if you really love it. If you are doing something because you don't really want to do it, but you think it's socially respectable or you think somebody will like you for it, you're not going to be great at it. If you take a look at all the people in the Forbes 400 who built companies, everyone built it, those companies not because they wanted to make a lot of money, because they loved the idea behind the company. In my case, I never thought I would be very, very wealthy. I had no, no uh, interest in it. I grew up in a very modest family. My parents did not graduate from college. My parents didn't graduate from high school. Um, I, I was an only child, very uh, um, kind of a narrow uh, uh, upbringing in Baltimore, which was socially isolated because all the people who were Jewish had to live in a very given area, in a certain area. Jews could not buy homes in any other place in Baltimore except in a narrow area. And so um, I uh, didn't really know much about money, didn't aspire to make it. When I started Carlisle, making money really wasn't the big deal. I was just interested in building something and having something that I could say I, I created on my own. And so in all of your, your careers, what you should do is focus on something that you really love and that you want to do. And don't worry about the money. Don't worry about the, what, what people think about it. Don't worry what your parents think. Do something you really love. Now, a second point I'd like to convey is this. All of you got here today because you did something impressive in your careers already or your lives already. And so you won a fellowship. And uh, you know a lot of people wanted these fellowships, and you're very uh, privileged to get them. Um, in my case, I would not have been qualified to get one of these fellowships. I wasn't that distinguished, so I would not have been qualified. And, and the truth is, I look at the people that you've, you're going to be seeing today and you saw last night, very few of them at your stage in their lives would have qualified for these things either. So the point, though, is that many of these people you're going to see today have accomplished a lot in their life. Um, but they weren't all that distinguished at your period in, in, in life. So what happened? Well, what happens very often in life is very... If you regard your life and divide it into three parts, the first third is probably when you're, you're, you're growing up and you're getting educated and you're getting your degrees and so forth. The second third is where you really more or less master your career, master your craft, and really build something. And the third is where you have an opportunity to kind of live uh, the fruits of the benefits of what you've created. It might be wealth. It might be uh, social entrepreneurial kinds of activities. It might be reputation. It might be other things. But if you look at the first third of your life, all of you have, are winners in the first third of your life. Maybe some of you have overcome some difficulties, but you've won this award and you've been recognized for what you've done. But very often, the people who win the first third of the life don't win the second third and third third of life. Most of the people that you're going to see today did not win the first third of their lives. 
they would not have been qualified for the, the award that you're getting and, and, and you've, you've already received. And, and the reason for that is that very often if you get these great awards as a young person, you can coast on your laurels. You can just rest the rest of your life and say, well, I got into Harvard, I went to Harvard Business School, I went to the Kennedy School, I went to NYU, I won a uh, Reynolds Fellowship. And all of a sudden you can coast and the, the, the energy and the drive that took it for you to get these awards, you kind of lose it. Now, there's an American Academy achievement that Wayne Reynolds um, uh, put together that some of you are familiar. His father started it, and some of you may have heard of it. It awards people um, uh, various types of uh, awards for what they have achieved as a young person, and then there is a, what I call the senior division um, for people in later in life. Well, of the thousand or so people over the years who have been awarded um, a membership in this academy, only about maybe less than 10 have actually won the junior division and then gone to the senior division. In other words, very few people in the early stage of their life, the first third, have done such a wonderful job that they continued that and they won the recognition that would get them into the senior division, what I'll call the American Academy of Achievement, and that's no different than many other things. Many of the people that you might read about in, in other distinguished areas of life, and many of the people you're going to see today, are not people who won the first third of their lives. So you have a burden having won the first third of your lives, the burden is to fulfill the ambition and, and the uh, expectations that people have for you. It would be very easy for you the rest of your life to just say, well, I won all these fellowships, I went to Harvard, I went to NYU, I did other things, and just coast on that. And I'm saying life won't be terrible if you do that, but you'll enjoy life much more if you actually um, you know, work as hard the second third of your life and the third third of your life as you did in the first third. Um, a, sec a third point I wanted to make is that you should not obsess over money. Uh, some of you are going to go into business and some of you are not going to go into business. Um, it's easy as you might sit there and say, well, he has a lot of money, so it's easy for him to say, um, you know, don't worry about money. The truth is, I, I know a lot of people who are fabulously wealthy. I probably know half the people in the Forbes 400 who made money, and I wouldn't say there's a lot of happiness there. Uh, there is no direct relationship between money and happiness. As many people may know, most of the billionaires that I know are tortured people. Um, they are not all that happy. So if you want to make money, you know, that's okay, but you should do what you want in life and not worry about money. If, if mo money may come along and, and you'll figure out what to do with it, but you shouldn't try to make your whole life revolve around money because you'll be very dissatisfied if you do. Most of the people who just obsess over money in the end don't know what to do with it. They don't know how to give it away. They don't know how to spend it. They don't know how to handle it properly. So what you should do is do something useful with your life that might involve giving away money if you earn it, but you don't have to make a lot of money to do something useful with your life. Now, most people on their deathbed don't say, I wish I made a little bit more money. They don't do that. <laughs> They don't say, I wish I worked a little bit harder and I had a bigger net worth when I died. They don't do that. They say, I wish I had spent more time with my family. I wish I had spent more time um, with my community. And I wish I had helped to make the world a better place when I was here. And so that's what you should really worry about. A fourth point I wanted to convey is uh, humility. Um, I think one of the best ways to get through life is to not show arrogance. Uh, that isn't very true in Washington, D.C. generally. Uh, there's a high degree of arrogance. <laughs> but generally, you can accomplish almost anything if you're willing to share the credit for it, and you're willing to use the word we rather than, than the word I, and you're willing to basically um, tell people that you, what you've accomplished might be okay, but it's not something that is that spectacular, and talk about what other people have accomplished. Most people only want to talk about themselves. The key to life is listening to what other people want to talk about. And when you engage in conversations, you want to get people to do things, listen to what they want to do. And that's the last point I want to get to. It's the, it's the way to be a leader. Now, you're going to meet a lot of leaders today, and everybody has a different formula for how to be a leader, and there's no one perfect formula. People study leadership all the time, but it's very difficult to really teach it. Just one lesson I would try to give you to think about, and that's this. There was a very famous book written in 1958 or 59 called The, the, Power, uh, the Power of the Presidency or presidential power, written by a man named Richard Neustadt. And what he said was, the President of the United States actually has very little power. He only has the power to persuade other people to do something. The President can't really do very much himself. He can persuade Congress, perhaps, or his cabinet officers, or the public, but he has to persuade people. And the truth is, almost everything you do in life is a matter of persuading other people to do something. That's what leadership is about. You know, you can't lead yourself, so you can lead other people. And when you lead other people, you do it by one of three ways by giving a good example of something, by your own actions, so people follow what you've done. You're a leader in a military, you, you, know, you run up the hill, and you take the charge yourself, and people will follow you, um, so by actions. Uh, a second way is by oral communication. 
uh, people can be very effective in orally communicating. You make a good speech, you, you know how to talk to people, and you convince people to do what you want them to do. And a third, of course, is writing. Uh, know how to communicate by writing. Now, very few people, in my view, are educated very well in schools these days about these two latter skills. One is to communicate very well orally, and one is to communicate very well by written word. And I think all of you, if you want to be leaders and you want to persuade people to follow you, perfect your skills in speaking and perfect your skills in writing because that will enable you to really transform the world because once you can convince people to follow what you say and what you write about people will follow you and you'll be able to accomplish whatever you want in business or in, in social entrepreneurial type activities or whatever it is in life so let me conclude there by saying I'm very privileged, privileged to be here I wish I had been talented enough at my age to be one of you I wasn't um, but if you want to be one of the senior people speaking to a future group of you, you know, don't give up and keep working as hard as you did to get to where you are today. Keep working the second third of your life as hard as you did in the first third of your life. Thank you very much.